I'm really happy to be here today, and it's so wonderful to see. Last year we had a little event that was a fraction of this, and it's really important. Uh, th everyone here, caregivers, and more importantly, for all of you in the community to get the word out, because um, when Alice said change the paradigm, what does that mean? Well, first of all, Hippocrates said, it's more important to know the patient than it is to know the disease. We need to move from a symptomatic approach, although absolutely necessary to provide comfort to patients, to a more approach that is addressing the issues globally. So we want to look at things globally. So we have, as Dr. Mandel said, and what he's doing, putting together his wellness programs, what we do as a naturopathic medical doctor, one of the tenets that we adhere to is the healing power of nature. This medicatrix naturae. So it's that healing power of nature that we're trying to engage. Now, how do we do that? We do that by looking at the underlying ecosystems. So what is a common thread here is one, I like to call them CRPS RSD literate doctors. This is a crucial element. We need to educate the physicians more to be able to spot this condition faster so that treatment can be provided. As we've heard today, the use of ketamine and some of these other things, when done quickly, can be very effective. The longer it's established, the more difficult it is. So we need to create a literacy among physicians to recognize this with speed. I'm always on the outlook for it now, of course, being involved with this organization and, 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 and people who have this, I'm always on the outlook when I'm starting to get symptoms of pain that just don't sound right to me. So approaching things globally. So your physician that you hire needs to ask you about your life, about your diet, about your supplements, about your psychosocial relationships, about everything in your life to understand who you are and where you're coming from. And of course, in this condition, as we see with Taylor, it can happen to a child. It can happen to someone older. It can happen to men. Happens four to one more in women, but it happens to men too. So we need to understand what's going on. So in part of that, what we do at Integrative Health Solutions is we take a global approach. And by doing so, what I refer to as first, it's, this, it's the pillars of health. So the first thing we need to look at is what I stated about where's this person coming from? Who is this person? Secondly, we want to look at their endocrine functions. Because when you've been in chronic pain or even acute pain, that is the same as you running away from a bear. You have a system that's described as the fight or flight system where you release adrenaline and different hormones. Over time, you can only run away from the bear for so long before you just want to lay down and let it eat you because you're tired. This system, known as the adrenal system, is an important element in understanding where is that person in their stress, what's going on with their cortisol, and how do we address this. Now, the widespread use of opiates, although effective, are bringing up their own set of problems because there's been a number of studies lately in the last year that show that chronic opiate use increases pain. And so we want to try to get away from it from long-term use because we get now into a cyclical pain cycle. And is it the opiate or is it the pain you're struggling with? Now, the use of opiates, well known. If somebody is on opiate medication, their hypothalamic pituitary axis or their endocrine system is shot. That means if you're a man, you have no testosterone. It means if you're a woman, your menses are off, your hormones are off. When we talk about the endocrine triad, I want you to think about it like this. Think about a three-legged stool that you're trying to sit on. You have your thyroid gland, you have your adrenal glands, and you have your gonads, which would be the ovaries or testes, respectively, man or woman. Imagine if one of those has a shorter leg. How are you going to sit on the stool? You're out of balance. And part of the approach is really taking CRPS out of the equation and saying, who is this person? 
how can we improve their ecosystem? How can we improve their overall health so that they can then move towards getting better and being well? And that involves a lot of the concepts of mind-body. That involves the, the social interactions. That involves the mindfulness and positive thinking that we heard people talking about. So what we're doing is trying to support somebody on all their pillars so that they have the inner tools and the inner fortitude to be able to step forward and move forward along that continuum where we have optimal wellness on the right and death on the left. We just want to be pushing somebody to the right. It may be baby steps, small at a time, but at least we're moving that way. So when you look at the endocrine system, it's essential that you assess this. You assess the adrenals. You assess what their cortisol levels are. You assess what their hormone levels are. More importantly, especially in the women, you assess what their thyroid function is. And traditional thyroid function is woefully inadequate. Woefully inadequate. And uh, so if you've been told by your doctor your thyroid is fine, well, you better educate yourself as to thyroid function because there's free hormones roaming around that are active. TSH, which is what is normally checked, is really uh, a result of the pituitary calling for more or calling for less. It doesn't really represent tissue levels, which when somebody is in pain, when nerves are screaming, when the nervous system is screaming, we need to understand what is available to this person and what they're getting. Next, which is very interesting, is what is known as the microbiome. How many of you know what the microbiome is? Great, I can teach you something new. So we have approximately 2.2 pounds of bugs living inside our intestinal tract, about a kilo. Those bugs are responsible for not only the food that you eat, the absorption and processing of nutrients, the immune system function, and when we look at CRPS, is this an autoimmune disease? It hasn't been defined yet, but there's certainly something going on. 55 to 60 percent of our immune system is located in our intestinal tract. So if we do not assess our microbiome, what are the bugs living within us? What are they doing? Are they the correct bugs? Are they in the right balance? Or are there potential bad bugs, pathogens, that shouldn't be there that are altering our immune function? So assessment of what is going on in the microbiome is important because what changes our microbiome? For example, antibiotics change our microbiome. Oral birth controls change our microbiome. Opiates change our microbiome. Corticosteroids change our microbiome. If our microbiome isn't right, achieving optimal wellness is more difficult. Now, there's been a lot of associations in the literature now, and in the next few years, we're going to start seeing neuropsychiatric illnesses are associated with the microbiome, our gut. Now, the gut is known as our second brain. It's where we produce much of our serotonin. So when we take antidepressants and we're looking to change brain biochemistry, if we actually focus down below where we're producing much of our serotonin, we could have a much bigger hit. So there's a lot of research now right here at UCSD, and I'm friends with some of the doctors over there and the PhDs doing it, where they're mapping the human microbiome and its association to neuropsychiatric illness. And they are finding that people who have certain organisms within them are more, more prone to things such as bipolar disease, to depression. So it's very important when we look at an entity like CRPS that we really don't have a good pathophysiological definition of what is causing this. Why? Nobody knows. We need to then back up and simplify and say, let's take CRPS out of the equation and let's look at this person. Yes, they're in pain. Yes, they have to do what they're doing. But what about that person? All of this discussion is, is, is not necessarily focused on that overall picture of what's going on with the person. Next, I want to focus on what causes disruption in that intestinal tract. Well, food allergies, for sure. I mean, I saw gluten-free entries here, which is great. Gluten has been shown in the annals of rheumatology to induce lupus-like autoimmune antibodies. So if you're eating a lot of gluten, well, you're certainly creating a pro-inflammatory state inside your body, and this is an inflammatory state. So we're looking to reduce inflammation. 
so when we look at food allergies, there are methods by which you can test this. Wouldn't it be nice to know, you know what, those cranberries I put on my salad, gosh, they're not so good for me. Maybe I'll avoid them. Now the reason being, you see, is the more inflammation you have in your gut, the more of the disruption of the microbiome there is, the more leaky your gut or permeable it comes. If you think about it, the food you just ate did not go into your body. It went into your intestinal tract. We are designed as a tube within a tube. Your mouth is here. There's a tube that goes all the way to the other end. Selectively, your body processes the food proteins and carbohydrates and selectively via the microbes in your gut assimilates them for your body's use. Now, if your intestines are leaking like a hose with little holes in them, larger food particles can be absorbed, which then initiates an inflammatory immune reaction. The more that occurs, the more the holes become larger and larger and larger. That's what we're looking to correct. So to correct in the microbiome, we have to identify what are you doing that's causing this? What's in there that could be causing this? Because the fix is really simple. Eliminate what you're doing, remove what's bad in there, and the body can heal itself, the healing power of nature. Next, we have to talk about mitochondria. So we all do we have, we know what mitochondria are? The powerhouses of the cells, like the cell phone batteries that you have. Well, now just think, what happens if when your cell phone starts dying in 20 minutes on a full charge? That battery's no good. Well, we have batteries inside of us. Those mitochondria are crucial to energy production. And if you think of your nerve cells, if you think of your brain, if you think of the autonomic and central nervous system, these cells need energy. If you're running at a lower energy state, they're not optim operating optimally. So, looking at mitochondrial dysfunction, we have to assess what is the nutrient status of this human being. You all think because you had food that you don't need anything. The conventional wisdom is vitamins are a waste of time. You don't need it, you get it from your food. Well, let me ask you this. Are we living in 1940 when the milk was delivered by the milkman and it had the fat and you had to separate it apart? Are we living where the farms are nearby? Is our food processed where they just put calcium, nitrogen, and phosphorus to grow a leaf, a root, or a fruit? Where are the rivers, where are the fields laid fallow for seven years so that the micronutrients can be absorbed into these plants that we consume? It's mass produced. So the fact of the matter is even eating an organic diet, even the organic farms are still processing and producing. They're not letting fields lay fallow for seven years because it's not economical. So when we assess nutrient status on people, there's scientific ways to do that. For example, through your blood, where they culture your cells and spectrophotometrically using light, they're able to feed your cells individual nutrients, B1 and B2 and B3 and CoQ10 and glutathione and antioxidants. And if it grows, it means you need it. So it would be as if you had a 20 tomato plants and said, I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to put this fertilizer and this fertilizer and this fertilizer and observe which one makes the plant grow better. So if you can imagine, as you can, can, can see, if you can identify these things in an individual, you can improve their overall state of health. When looking at the mitochondria, they need nutrients, such as CoQ10 is a crucial element for the nutrients, for the mitochondria to produce energy. Some of the things that really are interesting are when we look at mitochondrial dysfunction is what's going on in our environment. What are in our environmental toxic burden? Because what people don't think and what the mass produced medicine wants to lead you to believe, or they haven't thought about it, is are we all the same? I don't see anybody who looks like me here, and I actually don't see anybody who looks like anybody else. So to assume that what you or you or you or you or you need is the same as what I need might be a stretch because we're different creatures who have had different lives, different histories, different mothers because we are all a representation of where our mother was when she conceived us. So we don't come out all equal. We don't come out the same. If our mother was deficient, well, we're going to come out with certain deficiencies because the baby just didn't have it. Now, that doesn't mean birth defects. That doesn't mean that. We're talking about optimal status. It's well known, babies born to C-section, 
don't get inoculated by pers passing through the birth canal. And they've now associated that with obesity because of the lack of the inoculation of the bugs getting into the baby's mouth actually seeding a sterile intestinal tract of the baby. That's how important it is. And so when we look at environmental toxins, especially with somebody with a quote unquote chronic illness, it's important to assess, and the physician must do this, where did you grow up? Were you near a farm? Were you near a golf course? What were you exposed to? Did your mother spray pesticides around the house? You, a, a physician has to do a brief environmental questionnaire, is this person possibly have some elements? Are you eating uh, uh, tuna sushi frequently? Do you like spicy tuna rolls? Well, in New York City, thanks to Mayor Bloomberg, who, you know, we, he believes that we're not bright enough to be able to decide if we want a 32-ounce big sugary drink. <laughs> so we're going to control us. But the fact is, is they six pieces of tuna sushi can be toxic for mercury. The problem is the oceans have been poisoned. So the issue there is, again, back to the individuality is, we have systems within us that detoxify us. We're meant to handle toxins. It's like lifting weights. People who avoid everything, in my experience, become painted into a corner because the body likes a challenge. It's good if you're a healthy, robust individual. Go eat some bread. Go eat some crud. Because your body's going to have to deal with that burden. It's not good to be totally away from that because it's like lifting weights. If you never lift weights, you don't build muscle. When you get a cold, for example, the way I like to look at it, it's your immune system responding. It's good. You've created antibodies. You mount a fever. You mount a response. So when we look at environmental toxins, we go to the next point of what I like to identify is genetic variability. And that's what I was getting at. Because we now know with the Human Genome product, pro Project that there are genes that are involved in detoxification. Some people, unfortunately, have inherited from their mother and father different genes that mean if I have six pieces of tuna sushi and you have six pieces of tuna sushi, that six pieces is much worse for you because you don't eliminate the poison as rapidly. A common one is known as MTHFR, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. This takes vitamin B12 and activates it to the active form. And so people who have these genetic variations, which 23andMe was doing for $99, you can determine, you can determine, am I a poor detoxifier, which then leads you to the next step of, let's do some investigation via urine analysis for organosolvents. Because remember, in the environment, we have metals. And we have organosolvents like gasoline, toluene, styrene, the BPAs, the phthalates. So these are things that in questioning, a physician can actually say, hey, and very inexpensive testing, $100, uh, not expensive testing, but they can sort of question you and say, you know what, let's just rule that out. Let's make sure we don't have something, it's known as an obstacle to cure. Let's get rid of all our obstacles so that we can start moving forward with all the great doctors around, with the ketamine, with all the different therapies that we have. Let's make sure there's no obstacles to cure. So our genetic variability can set us up. And I think as time goes on, we're going to find, just like with fibromyalgia, that there are certain nerves and neurons that are different in these people. So we're going to find, as more time goes on, and as this becomes a more well-known and studied issue, that there's going to be genetic variability that allows somebody to be susceptible to this, that if we know about it, we can get in there and do something quickly. So that's where looking at the whole person and changing the paradigm, the, the goal is not necessarily to cure CRPS. The goal is to make somebody healthier with their CRPS and move them forward. And in my experience with patients, doing that for them and identifying these things is very healing in and of itself because they start to understand, gosh, I am a unique individual. I am not like this one or that one. And this may be a causative factor why this happened to me. And a lot of times that in and of itself is helpful because it, it changes the viewpoint of being a victim to your body as opposed to just not having understood your body and now having tools to be able to do something to move forward with that information. And that's called hope. And that's very important in healing. And if I can identify hopeful avenues that are scientifically based 
black and white, some of these reports are in color, to a person and say, look, this may has, have predisposed you to this. But we can now do something about it. The worst part of all of this information is we didn't know it at the time. Now we do. So now, and it's simple much of it. It's simple nutrient intervention. It's simple identifying what we need to do that moves somebody forward. When I look at some of my gals who are in their late 30s, early 40s, going up to 60s, who's addressing their hormones? I mean, I have normal women who feel like hell let alone a woman who's been in chronic pain. And there's no addressing this. And then how much is her mental, emotional, psychic portion of her life, along with the pain, compounded by the fact that everybody sees her as a CRPSer and not as just a woman who needs help in other areas. And so by helping these other areas, now we can start eliminating a lot of the, the fog around it and say, look, you're good hormonally, you're good environmentally, your microbiome spot on, your, 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 your endorphin levels are better, your cortisol, your adrenals are better. And I guarantee you, somebody who, if I was to go through a checklist of all those things and say better, 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 they're not going to be in the same place. They're not going to be in the same place. Because I go back to what I said. Anybody in chronic pain, if I took a normal person and I just pinched them all day long, it's like you know the Chinese water torture. How do they do that? Drip, 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 drip. Over time, that's, that'll kill you. So a normal person cannot take it, let alone somebody who has this. So the pain itself is a reason to be proactive in identifying, because the pain brings you down. But nobody's talking about building up. Nobody's talking about how to structurally, nutritionally, biochemically rebuild the body. And that's where the paradigm shift is changing. And that's where this is a hopeful avenue. And again, as I say, no one's talking about curing it. What we're talking about, though, is your body. Like when you bring your car to the shop. They hook it up to a computer and can tell you everything that's wrong with it. Why can't we do that for our bodies? Who's done that for you here? How many of you suffering with this have actually had this done? I mean, Dr. Mandel's put his wellness together, and that's very forward thinking. How many have had these biometric assessments done? How many of the women here who are over 35, 40, 43, 45, know their hormone levels, know their testosterone levels? Testosterone builds muscle. Testosterone gives you oomph. Testosterone can help with these things. So if it's low, and remember I said, if you're in chronic pain, no man, no woman has good hormones. The opiates destroy them. And so this is where the comprehensive approach both helps, it gives avenues where there's none. What can I do? Well, mm, go to do what you're doing. You're doing good. Have your treatments. You're doing good. But what about now a whole other avenue of investigation that opens up genetics, biologic variability, individuality, nutrition, diet, your microbiome? These are the amazing aspects that then provide an individual with another pillar by which they can support themselves, by which their caregivers and their loved ones and the people who care for them have a support. And they can actually then be moving forward and working towards getting better. And so, you know, that's, the, that's basically what the changing of the paradigm and the individuality, the biochemistry really is looking to get at, is taking the CRPS out of the picture as if you're a normal person. When somebody with CRPS comes in, I'm like, look, I want to table that for a minute. I want to look at you as a normal woman, a normal male. Let me do what I do for the normal person. Let's look at this. Of course, with the, with, the, with the notion that I'm looking at these specific items, where I might not do that in someone with no complaints, but I want to table that for a second, and I just want to approach you as a person. Because sometimes when it's really complex, you have to become simple again. You got to go back to basics and get away from it. And a lot of times in doing that, I mean, it just provides so much for the individual. And of course, with the discussion, with the education, with the understanding, when we have these beautiful reports, look, your coq tens low. The, that mitochondria is producing 30% of energy. Let me, give you some, let me give you some CoQ10 in the right form, in the right dose, at high doses, so that we supercharge your cell phone battery again. That 
is the approach that eventually has to go. So if anyone has any questions, that would be great. I have two questions for you. The first one, you talked about the diet changes and things that you would be looking at. How long are you asking somebody to do that when changing your diet, when you love certain foods and you don't want to give them up, but you're willing to give it a try for a specified amount of time? So what are you looking at for that? Okay, so with foods in the old days, if a physician wanted to know what you shouldn't eat, they would ask you, what do you love? What can't you be without? And that's what you're allergic to. That's the old days. And it generally holds true. Now what we do is we do the allergy testing so you have it in black and white. Now when you do that kind of testing, it's graded on a scale, usually zero to three. The threes have to be eliminated for a year. The twos are six months. The ones, eh, three months. And the zeros we don't pay attention to are the equivocals. So, so generally, like for example, gluten's a good six weeks to eliminate from your intestinal tract. But, but generally, it's more the identification of it so that we know maybe the food, I've had many times that a food somebody loves, they're not allergic to it, I'm like, eat it. The paper, it doesn't, the results don't indicate that you're immunologically reacting. So I don't want to take away things from people for no reason. Okay, and the other question was since um, anyone that would be coming to you from this group is on long-term opioids, probably for pain, and I saw on your website that you're looking at more natural pain relief or they're also on anti-inflammatories like Advil and things like that, are you asking them to eliminate those or work with you over time? Well, no, well, no. for example, I do prescribe a lot of low-dose naltrexone, nasal ketamine. Uh, I haven't really gotten into the intravenous ketamine just from a logistical point of view. Um, um, as far as NSAIDs go, no, pain management is essential. I'm absolutely not, I do not muck around. What my approach is though, I want to improve the situation so you feel confident that you can start titrating down. So that is not a deal. That is, you come in with whatever you're on. And I forgot to mention that NSAIDs also disrupt the intestinal lining and cause those food allergies. But nevertheless, what I'm here to do is mitigate the situation. So for example, I would give you gut repairing substances to mitigate the, the NSAIDs in the short run. And then as you're feeling better, then there's the discussion of how to begin taking that leap of faith to, OK, let's try to do some other things. I just wanted to know if you well, 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 well. <laughs> You can't get away. <laughs> um, do you take insurance or is it um, private pay? Well, unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, the insurance doesn't allow the time that I need to spend with a patient. In 2009, that stopped because 15 minutes wasn't enough. Now, the laboratory testing, much of this nutrient testing, hormonal testing, is covered. So I do have ways of getting for very small co-pays, uh, very, about $5,000 of testing covered for about $250, $300. So I do have those arrangements where I can get laboratory testing covered. Some of the esoterics, the environmentals, the adrenals, those are low cost. Those aren't, but the expensive ones are covered by insurance. So just our time is not covered. Okay. There also is a uh, neuropathic school in San Diego County. Naturopathic. Naturopathic. There's the Bastyr University Medical School which is right over here in the Hoya Sorrento Valley. So, um, yes, that's really good. So you have a clinic. Uh, here, then there, and that's it. Hi, I have two questions. Um, do you have anything that helps mitigate adrenal failure or fatigue? And then also, how does one address the methergene mutation issues? Absolutely, very good question. So when it comes to adrenal fatigue, one, we have to know where you're at. So where are those cortisol levels on force cortisol supply? Because if they're flat on, generally at that point I'm looking at high cortisol. Well, because remember, hold on. What does your adrenal produce? Cortisol. It's called cortisol. Don't don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. It is not prednisone. Hydrocortisone is a bioidentical hormone when used in low supportive doses, and especially in somebody who has already adrenal hyperfunction or a suppressed adrenal gland, okay. it is not a dangerous thing because we're supporting it. Because with it low, your body's in fight or flight. You're running on adrenaline. Because the body has to either run on adrenaline or cortisol. Cortisol is that duraflame log that burns for hours. I feel great. Adrenaline, I'm wired and tired. 
And so that, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are safe uses of hydrocortisone done by the right physician, not a problem. In terms of NTHMR, gene, obviously with somebody with CSPS, for all my patients who I find, just regular gals coming, I check everybody. I might give them an injectable protocol with a methyl B12, methylfolate, activated B6, Q5P. Obviously, with some of the CRPS, I'm avoiding needles at all costs. So we get sublingual doses of uh, methylcobalamin, methylfolate. Now, depending on the gene variation, you have to be a little bit careful because you can begin to overmethylate somebody. So although you say, oh, I'll take a bunch of vitamin B12, methylcobalamin, it can make you agitated and it can make insomnia occur. So in people with homozygous, meaning they have two copies or compound heterozygous, you start with low dose methylfolate because what methylation means, it's turning on all your cells. And imagine if you have some toxins because you have this thing and they build up over years, all of a sudden you're dumping all this garbage out. So you want to go really slow and you want to just take it easy and you start with the methylfolate. Um, on Amazon, you can get it from Jarrow, the low dose, you work it up over a number of weeks, and then you add in a little methylcobalamin so you don't get agitated, because the last thing I want is agitated women in my practice. <laughs> Question here? You have the compound head so you have one of each or, 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 or yes, so the compound heterozygous is actually the worst combination because you have two blocks in two different places working at about 10%. So I'd start with the methylfolate in about 400 microgram dose, and then you can, over about four to six weeks, you'll be able to ramp that up, and everything, and you'll notice this will be far and better. All right, so sir, first thank you for being here today. My question for you is, what are your thoughts about Cordellus for nerve inflammation, sir? Cordialis is a great Wait, herb. Great. Brian, they want I, I think everyone can hear me, right? They all say I speak No, Brian, we're, 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 we're recording. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. Yeah, sir. So Cory Dallas is a great herb. It's an adaptogen. It's an immune modulator. Um, and this actually goes back to the previous question when I had answered about the suppressed adrenal function, because part of the hydrocortisone uh, component of that would actually be adrenal rebuilding with adaptogens, such as Siberian ginseng, uh, even licorice root, because licorice root has an ability to allow your own cortisol to stay around by inhibiting an enzyme in the liver that breaks down cortisol. So a lot of times, you can use less cortisone by using licorice root because it, it delays the excretion of it. So Corydalis is a great herb immunomodulator. That's the beautiful thing about some of these botanicals is if it's high, it brings it down. If it's low, it brings it up. And that goes for the adrenals as well. So again, back, I would support your adrenals with supportive nutrients and herbs along with getting you out of the hole that you're in because you have to live. And it's usually about a 90-day protocol I do on the adrenal side of things and then wean somebody off of it. And the Corydalis is a great herb that's, along with others though, just doing one, what I find with the botanicals, it would be good to, you do it for three months and then you shift it over to another and that way the body doesn't become tolerant to it. And so there's a lot in that category of herbs. There's a lot. And, and um, there's plant sterols that, that modulate the immune system. There's a lot. So you would, you would flip and cycle it around so that the body is constantly getting a new signal. Great, guys. Thank you so much. Great.